Number 1. Harriet Elizabeth Riley, sometimes spelled Harriet, but for the sake of consistency, we'll stick with one T, was born to Mamie and Harold Riley somewhere in Florida on February 26, 1968. She was the third of the Georgia-born couple's children, with two older brothers and, according to some reports, possibly an unnamed younger brother. The Rileys were listed in the 1964 Sacramento Suburban City Directory as living at 545 Lindsay Avenue. It's unclear when exactly the Riley family moved to and from Sacramento, however, Mamie and Harold don't appear again in the area until 1971, when they're listed as living at 215 Olmsted Drive. Harriet set off to Larchmont Park at 3.45 p.m. that Thursday, with an understanding that she was to be home by 5.15. A witness saw the first grader playing alone on the sidewalk next to the park around 5 p.m. But, Harriet did not come home by 6 p.m. as expected. Mamie Riley phoned police, and the search began. Some feared a serial child predator was on the loose in North Sacramento. On October 24, 1974, 11-year-old Stephanie Black disappeared from a bus stop less than three miles from Larchmont Park. Eighteen days later, her decomposing body was discovered in a rice paddy. Over 200 sheriff's deputies and volunteers were aided by Air Force helicopters as they scoured the area through Thursday night and into Friday morning, when the search broadened to include surrounding rural areas, Stephanie Black's case fresh in their minds. Neighbors on Grattan Way many of whom had their own young, children reportedly searched for Harriet until the wee hours of Friday morning. Around 9.30 a.m., a cleaning woman opened the lid to dumpster at the nearby Terry Crest apartment complex to find the missing six-year-old's body. Harriet had been wrapped in a plastic sheet with a plastic bag over her head. Unlike the body of Stephanie Black, Harriet's body showed no obvious signs of violence or sexual assault. The coroner would later confirm the cause of death was suffocation. Mamie Riley was at home with the news on when she learned of her daughter's death law enforcement had yet to inform the mother that Harriet's body was found before the story ran on local TV. According to the B, Mamie promptly collapsed and was taken by ambulance to McClellan Air Force Base for treatment. Both the sheriff's department and local news outlets were harshly criticized in the following days. Befuddled searchers and investigators gathered outside the apartment complex, where the six-year-old's body was removed two hours after its discovery. The dumpster itself was also confiscated. Anger, fear, and confusion gripped North Highlands as investigators struggled to find substantive leads. Who could have done this? Why did someone do this? One week after the discovery of Riley's body, Sheriff Duane Lowe believed he and his investigators had finally determined what happened. In hopes of ameliorating some of the apprehensiveness and some of the anxiety that exists in the community, the sheriff decided to make their findings public. The story went that Harriet began playing with two six-year-old boys from the neighborhood while at Larchmont Park, it is unclear if Riley knew the boys before January 9. The two boys told detectives they were having a good time playing with Riley, first in the park, then in the residential neighborhood, and finally in one of the boys' homes, it's unclear where the home in question was located. The boys told investigators that the last game they played with Riley was the one that proved fatal. While the specifics are unclear, this game supposedly involved binding Riley's ankles with twine and covering her face in a plastic wrapping material. Sheriff Lowe said, We do not believe the two boys had any malice whatsoever in the game they were playing she, in all probability died by suffocation, and probably by accident. They are telling the truth as far as they can go. I'm completely satisfied with the validity of their statements. Spokesman Bill Miller added, We do not believe that these boys comprehend death but the sheriff admitted there were holes in his narrative that left the case wide open. For one, the boys were unable to explain what happened after the game ended. According to their account, Harriet was left for dead still bound and wrapped in plastic when boys left the home in question shortly after 7 p.m. It's unclear if anyone else was present at the time of the child's play. This raised the largest unanswered question of who exactly moved Harriet's body. We do not believe the body was moved by the little boys Sheriff Lowe stated during the press conference. While the sheriff said it was unclear who exactly did place Riley's body in the dumpster, he hinted at the possibility of parental involvement, stating his strong suspicion that felony child neglect was involved. She was one of the handful of unsolved homicides profiled by CBS Sacramento in 2015. Like the secret witness program four decades earlier, the Sacramento County Sheriff Department's cold case team was now actively seeking tips in Riley's unsolved homicide investigation. But there's something odd. 
in Riley's cold case listing, there is no mention of the previous accidental ruling, nor of any children potentially involved in her death. This is in spite of the fact the case was classified as a cleared homicide even without a conviction, according to 1977 Sacramento Bee reporting. Which leads me to wonder if law enforcement's perspective has changed since 1975. Has a fresh set of eyes concluded that maybe this wasn't a tragic accident after all? Or are authorities withholding information in an attempt to retroactively apply modern investigative procedure to determine who put the body in the dumpster? We know now that details of a crime are often not publicized to avoid false confessions, but was that common knowledge in 40 years ago? Maybe not. The Riley family endured more than lifetimes worth of tragedy in the span of three years. I can't imagine the true magnitude of the pain Mamie Riley endured in the early 1970s, but I can admire her strength. To the best of my knowledge, she and her other children are still alive, likely living in the southeast. But I can also be enraged for Mamie Riley. It should go without saying, but there's some serious injustice in losing both one's spouse and child to unsolved homicides in the span of three years. I am inclined to agree with Dr. Dave Coven and the Sacramento NAACP's statements. Would things have turned out differently if the Riley family was white? How significant was the impact of being black in the 1970s on both investigations? Could we even quantify the effect? I don't know how to satisfactorily answer any of these questions. I'm not even sure of my opinion on both homicide cases. Number 2 Cloud was last seen in Splendora, Texas on October 25, 2016. She left home that day to go out on a blind date with an unidentified male whom she may have met online. Her father didn't realize she didn't know the man until she'd already left. Cloud sent him a text message saying she would probably be back in the morning and if he didn't hear from her by 2 a.m. to call the police. Cloud's father got a text from her on October 26, the text read, I will see you in the morning the date went great, he's super nice I will call if I need anything. She said she'd be home on the 27th between 11 o'clock and 11.30 and her family could meet her date then. With each passing day, Beatty's hope for a good outcome erodes. I am starting to believe she is not out there, that she is not okay, he said. Part of me just wants to find her, just to get closure. I know it's only been seven months, but it's tearing my life apart. Beatty says he is angry and feels that not enough is being done to find his daughter. I have written both of our U.S. senators from Texas and the governor and asked that they form a missing person task force. People who have missing persons in their family get the same response from law enforcement that I am getting, Beatty said. They, the agencies, don't have the resources to devote enough time to missing person cases. They get handed over to detectives who are overloaded with violent crime cases and other things take priority. While that might be the case with other agencies, Spencer said it is not an accurate opinion of the sheriff's office. The detective who is working the case is in constant communication with her grandmother. Some of the family members have heard our investigation more than they have helped. They logged into her social media accounts that we could have used to develop leads, Spencer said. We get that they are frustrated. We get that they are upset, but we are doing everything we can to find her. According to Spencer, the sheriff's office is still considering the possibility that she might have voluntarily walked away from her family, a claim her father vehemently denies. Beatty admits the two had a strained relationship, but says she would not have disappeared without a word to him or the grandmother who raised her. She wouldn't just disappear. Donna was free to come and go from my home. She is not a runaway, he said. Cloud is described as a white female, 5'1" weighing 120 pounds. She has dark hair and dark brown eyes. Some of her distinguishing characteristics are deep dimples on both cheeks and a piercing in her right nostril. She has a tattoo on her right forearm with the word faith, a cross tattoo on the middle finger of her right hand, a diamond tattoo on her right ring finger, and a tattoo that says, love is enough on her right collarbone. Cloud doesn't have any credit cards, and she left her car, money, identification and clothes behind. She also left a three-year-old son. Although her father stated his relationship with her was strained, he doesn't believe she would have left her family without letting them know where she was going. Her case remains unsolved. Anyone with information regarding Cloud's whereabouts is asked to contact the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office. Number 3 Amanda was last seen walking to school during the morning hours of October 13, 1997 in Gillette, Wyoming. She never arrived for classes that day and has not been heard from again. The school didn't notify her parents she was absent, and it wasn't until 6 p.m. that her family realized she'd never made it to class. 
Amanda had moved to the area only about six weeks prior to her disappearance. At the time, investigators believed she'd run away with her 20-year-old boyfriend, Patrick Deering. When questioned about Amanda's disappearance, Deering said he had last seen her at 7.15 a.m. the day she vanished. Police believed he was concealing her. On October 19, Deering also disappeared. His vehicle was found abandoned on the wrong side of the road, facing the wrong direction. He was never seen again. Wyoming authorities reopened her investigation in 2000 after being contacted by Montana investigators. Nathaniel Bar Jonah was arrested that year for the 1996 abduction and presumed murder of Zachary Ramsey. A photo of Bar Jonah is posted with this case summary. Authorities discovered unidentified bone fragments on Bar Jonah's property during a search and compared Amanda's DNA to the remains. The fragments did not match Amanda, Zachary or Janice Pocket, a child who disappeared from Connecticut in 1973. Officials have also investigated the possibility that Bar Jonah was involved in the 1978 Massachusetts disappearance of Andrew Amato. Bar Jonah, whose given name was David P. Brown, had a lengthy criminal history. He was convicted of sexually abusing children in the past and has confessed to cannibalistic activites. He was scheduled to be tried for Ramsey's presumed murder in 2002, but the charges were dismissed due to lack of evidence. Zachary's remains have never been located. Bar Jonah was never charged in connection with Amanda's case, and it is unknown if he was involved. He died of a blood clot in a Montana prison in April 2008, at age 51. In January 2007, James Strahl, an accused murderer from South Dakota, allegedly confessed to Amanda's murder. A photograph of Strahl is posted with this case summary. He was in jail awaiting trial in connection with the 1998 death of another man, William O'Hare, when one of his cellmates, Aloysius Black Crow, stated Strahl had bragged about killing Amanda. Strahl allegedly stated he picked up Amanda Hitchiking after she ran away from home and raped and killed her after she resisted his sexual advances. He said he was under the influence of drugs at the time of the murder. His employment records indicate he was absent from work around the time of Amanda's disappearance. Strahl, however, maintains his innocence in her case and stated he never confessed anything about her disappearance and Black Crow's story is a lie. Black Crow testified against Strahl at his trial for O'Hare's murder, although he was not allowed to mention Amanda. Strahl was convicted in September 2007 and sentenced to life in prison. His conviction was overturned, however, because of false testimony given by Black Crow in another case. In early 2006, Black Crow told investigators that one of his other cellmates, David Licken, had admitted to killing Pamela Jackson and Cheryl Miller, 17-year-old girls who disappeared together from South Dakota in 1971. Black Crow said he had obtained a taped confession from Licken, who was charged with murdering both girls in July 2007. However, in February 2008, it was discovered that Black Crow had framed Licken by getting another man to pose as him and confess in the tape recording. The murder charges against Licken were dropped as a result, though he remains incarcerated for an unrelated kidnapping and rape. In March 2008, Black Crow pleaded guilty to two counts of perjury and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. In 2013, authorities found Jackson and Miller's vehicle submerged in Brule Creek, with their bodies inside. They believe the young women didn't meet with foul play and instead accidentally drove their car into the water, where it lay undiscovered for 42 years. In May 2010, shortly before he was scheduled to be tried a second time for O'Hare's murder, Strahl reached an agreement with prosecutors. He pleaded no contest to grand theft and manslaughter and was sentenced to 35 years in prison. He also agreed to take a polygraph about his alleged involvement in Amanda's disappearance. Although many agencies continue to classify Amanda's disappearance as a runaway case, investigators believed that other factors may have been involved in Amanda's case since her social security number has not been used since her October 1997 disappearance. Deering's social security number has not been used either, indicating neither of them has gotten jobs, credit cards or driver's licenses. Amanda enjoyed playing the violin and singing country and western music in 1997. Her case remains open and unsolved. Number 4. It's been more than 36 years since the mysterious death of Eric Cross in Kalamazoo County. Cross was found dead near his parents' front yard in Vicksburg in June of 1983. He was 16 years old and had been walking home from a party. No arrests have been made. The details of what happened that night are unclear, but officials say he walked about a mile to his home on Y Avenue. After that, it's believed a group of teens picked him up, beat him and killed him by dragging him behind a car and running him over. 
The case has been unsolved for decades, and the Michigan Attorney General issued a statement following a possible lead in the case. We know this is a heartbreaking decision for the Cross family, but there is simply not enough evidence to criminally charge any of the remaining suspects with the death of Eric Cross. We can only imagine the decades of pain and anguish they have experienced, and we wish we were able to make a different decision. We did everything we could in this case, including re-interviewing witnesses, but it is clear that we will never know the truth about the tragic circumstances that led to the death of Eric Cross that night more than 36 years ago. We were hoping for good positive feedback, and you know, Hatfield said, they did give good feedback. It's just that we were hoping for arrest warrants. We were hoping for actual arrests today. We were hoping for more big movement on the case. Hatfield told us the AG's office has been investigating many leads, but the case is stalled. We are very thankful to the Attorney General's office, said Hatfield. They have put in a lot of effort, interviewing a lot of witnesses, doing a lot of follow-up on this case. It's not that they aren't working the case. There is just things that aren't ready, but they are not done with the case. The news came on Eric's late father's 81st birthday. Eric's sister, Jacqueline, expressed her feelings following the AG's findings in a letter to their father via Facebook. I thought we were going to take steps toward justice for your only son today, Jacqueline wrote. You grew up in a world where if you were a law-abiding positive contributor to society, you could expect that society would help you when you needed help. We don't live in that world anymore. Sadly, I will never have that much faith in humanity to keep persevering when the world spits in your face and leaves your son like a piece of trash to die on the side of the road with no justice. Love, your only daughter Jacqueline on the anniversary of his death, Eric's army walks the same path cross took the night he was killed. Each walk a manifestation of justice not served. If you have any information on the case, call the Kalamazoo County Sheriff's Department. Number 5. Lee was last seen at her family's residence in the 100 block of Honey Locust Drive in Tupelo, Mississippi on August 27, 1992. Her mother, Vicki Felton, saw her before leaving for work at 7.35 a.m. Lee planned to attend an open house at her school that day and was waiting for her grandmother to come pick her up. It was the first time her mother had left her at home alone. There were heavy storms that day as Hurricane Andrew moved over the area and Lee's mother was concerned for her as a result. Her mother tried to call her at 8.30 a.m., but got no answer. She tried to call once more before returning home, but there was still no answer. Felton became worried and returned home to check on Lee, and discovered that the garage door was open and the light was on, meaning the door had been activated in the past several minutes. Another door to the house was left unlocked. There was no sign of Lee at the scene, and she has not been seen again. Felton called the police at 9 a.m. to report her daughter's disappearance. There were no signs of forced entry into the home, but there were some indications that a struggle had taken place. Fresh, still wet stains of typo blood were inside the house on the walls, the carpet, and the bathroom countertop. There was a blood trail leading from the hallway to the living room to the back door, and blood and hair stuck to a doorframe, suggesting Lee hit her head on the doorframe. One of Lee's nightgowns and her brassiere, both items bloodstained, were in her bedroom. She had been wearing that nightgown when Felton left the house that morning. It looked like someone had made efforts to clean up the blood in the bathroom, but police couldn't find a used rag or towel anywhere. Lee's reading glasses, shoes, some of her underclothes and a sleeping bag were missing. Police searched the area with bloodhounds, but due to the weather conditions the dogs weren't able to get a scent. About one month after Lee's disappearance, her glasses arrived at her residence in the mail. They were addressed to B. Yarbrough, Lee's stepfather was named Barney Yarbrough. He and Lee's mother had separated a short time before her disappearance. The street name in the address on the envelope was misspelled Honey Locust, and the envelope had six stamps, twice as many as was needed. It was postmarked Boonville, Mississippi, a town about 30 miles north of Tupelo. There was nothing else in the envelope. Handwriting and forensic tests on the envelope yielded no results, the stamps had been wet with water, and there was no DNA on the envelope. The person who mailed the glasses has never been identified, but police think the glasses were mailed to mislead the investigation. Fourteen months after Lee's disappearance, a skull was found in a soybean field and identified as Lee's. It turned out the state medical examiner's office was not using Lee's most recent dental records, and the skull wasn't hers after all. It was later identified as a missing 27-year-old woman. Authorities stated they had very little evidence to determine who was responsible for Lee's disappearance. Several persons of interest have been interviewed, but no one has been charged in connection with her case. 
Felton was given three polygraphs and failed all of them, but she hasn't been identified as a suspect. She stated she believes Oscar Mike Kearns, a local man who knew Lee through church, was responsible for her disappearance. Nine months after Lee's disappearance, Kearns abducted a 15-year-old girl from her home in Memphis, Tennessee, sexually assaulted her and released her. He had also known the victim through church. Kearns pleaded guilty to rape and was sentenced to eight years in prison, but was released after less than four. After his release, he kidnapped a married couple and raped the wife and was sent back to prison. He is scheduled for release in 2019. He has refused to be interviewed or polygraphed about Lee's disappearance. Lee resided alone with her mother at the time of her disappearance. She was about to begin the eighth grade at Tupelo Middle School. Her father, who divorced from her mother in 1981, was in the United States Army and was stationed out of state. Felton is also a veteran of the armed forces. Lee's father got emergency leave from the military after her disappearance and moved to Tupelo with his family so he could assist in the search for his daughter. He stated although he wasn't able to see Lee often due to his military obligations, they had a close relationship. He believes someone within the family was involved in Lee's disappearance. Both Lee's father and her stepfather passed polygraph tests and were ruled out as suspects in her case. Her stepfather is now deceased and her mother lives in Michigan. Lee's boyfriend, who was 11 years old at the time of Lee's disappearance, was never questioned by police. Foul play is strongly suspected in Lee's disappearance, which remains unsolved. Number 6 Farthing was last seen at a friend's house in the 100 block of Dillon Court in Beria, Kentucky, in the early morning hours of June 22, 2013. She had attended a party the night before with her sister, a cousin and some friends. Eventually, most of the others left, and Farthing stayed behind at the party. She had a friend there who was going to give her a ride home, but the two females argued and Farthing's friend left without her. She sent multiple text messages overnight trying to get a ride home, saying she felt scared. She wanted her ex-fiancé to pick her up, but he didn't get off work until later in the morning. The last text from her phone was sent at 5.30 a.m., saying, Never mind, I'm okay. I'm going to a party in Rockcastle County. Farthing's friend who owned the house left to take care of a horse. When he left, he said, she was sitting on the couch smoking. When he returned at 7 a.m., the house was on fire and Farthing was missing, but her cowboy boots, purse and some clothes were still there. The only item missing was her cellular phone. She has never been heard from again, and an extensive search of the area turned up no sign of her. The house fire began on the couch and almost completely consumed it and burned a hole in the floor underneath, but it was extinguished before it got out of control. It was ruled suspicious. The homeowner was in the process of moving out, and as a result, utilities to the house had been turned off for weeks, and there was no electricity there at all. Investigators believe Farthing may have been taken against her will, and they think the last text message sent from her phone actually was sent by someone else. Farthing is a graduate of Madison Southern High School. Her family doesn't believe she would have left the house without her belongings, and they stated she had no reason to walk out of her life. Her case remains unsolved.